has the smallest waist. Actress even rouges, gums and tongue. Actress with small waist makes women gasp. Oh my God. Coming with a nose ring, Mademoiselle Polaire expects to introduce a new fashion in America. Ugly as beauty wears a ring at her nose. Emily Marie Bouchard was born to French parents in Algeria in May of 1874, but we will not be calling her Emily, we will be calling her Polaire. Not only was she a famous actress throughout the world, but she was also the woman to have reportedly the smallest waist in the world during the Edwardian era. And today we are going to be talking about her because not only is she interesting, not only is she problematic, not only is she just kind of batshit crazy, but her pictures are the pictures that are shared on the internet whenever people talk about wasp waist and tiny waist of the Victorian and Edwardian era. Very little is actually known about Polaire's early life simply because we have a bunch of conflicting information from different qualities of sources. One of the sources says actually that Polaire's family was actually involved in performance and in theater and in productions. To the great disappointment of her parents, Polaire gave no indication of being able to join them in their stage turn. Her mother discovered that the only attractive possession of her daughter was a naturally small waist, which she lost no time in cultivating to the then popular hour glass shape. This source is actually from a scrapbook about tight lacing and fetish from the Indian University Kenzie Institute. This is like a magazine letter to the editor where they're reflecting on the life of Polaire. But sometime in the 1880s, 1890s, like very, very early 1890s, Polaire moves from Algeria to France in order to pursue the stage. She gets her start as a gamouze. From what I understand, this not quite character, character archetype, a kind of sexually suggestive, seductive, sort of lewd, also comedic, kind of wild dancer, dressed provocatively female, like performer character within the cafe concerts. Keeping all those things in mind, those things specifically, like how she dressed, how she looked, her antics, her dancing, her being kind of sexually provocative, all of this is actually what she became really, really famous for just like 10, 20 years later. And her brother was also a relatively famous singer around this time, and he was also working in cafe concerts. So it's a pretty simple jump to make the assumption that her brother helped her get work. And from cafe concerts, she went into music halls, and in 1895, she was actually painted by Toulouse-Lautrec at the Moulin Rouge, and Le Rire, Le Rire? Le Rire? Le Rire? Le Rire? Le Rire? Le Rire? Whatever. Published <laughs> this drawing of her as like a cover art. And she also went to New York at this time in 1895 to try and make a name for herself. N not that it actually went that well. Mademoiselle Polaire was a new performer. She's one of those Parisian importations known as chanteuses en centriques. Everybody who has been in the up to date New York musicals knows what that means. I assume they're trying to say sex worker, but I don't know. She wasn't a sex worker from what we can tell. Anyways. Colette, you are her, the living Claudine. Early 1900s, around 1902, 1903, Polaire lands the role of a lifetime. And that is of Claudine. But there's a whole like, mythos around how she got the part of Claudine. And I'm not gonna go into it because it really isn't relevant to this discussion. But basically this woman who had no shits to give and very little left to lose because she was basically 30 at this point, just basically walked up to Willie and was like, I'm Claudine. And Willie was like, mm, who are you? And she was like, I'm Claudine, bitch. And eventually like Willie gave in, she became Claudine. She blew up, obviously Claudine was a huge success. That completely set her career on fire. I mean, just like a rocket ship, okay? After the just huge success of Claudine, Polaire is cast in another show that also just completely sights. Like just, she was here and then it just blew up even more. And that is of Le Visiteur. And this show actually blew up. It was in London. Then eventually she decides to go back to New York. The run from what we can tell was a success. And throughout the entire media blitz about her, while there's other things mentioned, her waist size is always mentioned. Well, hello there. Welcome to the most exciting part of this entire video, the sponsorship portion of this week's video, which by the way, the sponsor of this week's video is none other than Skillshare. As a big old giant nerdy nerd, I love that Skillshare has 
thousands of classes for you to take just whenever you feel like it. So whether you want to learn something creative or something, I don't know, business centric, Skillshare has a class for you. Speaking of creative classes, Skillshare has recently released some new sewing classes with none other than Style and Seam Robin Burgess. I had the pleasure of finally meeting Robin in real life at Easter at Dandy's event and she is lovely, she is stunning, she is gorgeous. She makes incredible stuff. She's worked with Skillshare to release a few sewing classes, everything from super, super beginner stuff about like how to make yourself a little zippered bag to more complicated ideas about like how to fit a muslin to yourself and how to sew and customize clothing for you. Now, if you are someone, I'm being serious right now, so focus. If you are someone who deals with confidence issues, you know who you are. Well, Skillshare has a class for that too, because we don't need, we don't need confidence issues, you can do it. You hear me? You can do it. If you would like to work on your creative confidence, because trust me, everyone who's a creative deals with like imposter syndrome and crippling doubt about their ability to do their job. It's fine. So there's two classes I want to tell you about. The first one is creative confidence, unlocking your potential with Emma Gannon. And the other one I want to tell you about is confidence for creatives with Eugenia Washington. Because the thing is, as a creative person, we deal with self-doubt all the time. And frankly, it's one of the biggest things that gets in our way. So anything that can kind of help you get out of your brain and get to creating is like a 10 out of 10 great idea, right? So if you would like to give Skillshare a try, the first 1,000 people to click the link in my description below will get you one month free of Skillshare. So that way you can try it out. And I highly recommend it. It's amazing. Huge thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. So with that, let's get back to talking about Polar. Woo! Woo! Does this sound cool? I don't know, we'll find out. At this point in time, actually, one of the things I do find generally interesting is the fact that Polaire is not that young. By the time her career really started to blow up, she would have been like in her early 30s. You know, she had a pretty good Saturn return, I gotta say. But it does also kind of help provide some context as to why she got into the antics that she did and why she behaved the way that she did. Because Polaire was not just a pretty face. You know, she wasn't a young ingenue who could just rely on her looks and like a pretty voice to build her name. She was older, she was different looking, and she apparently couldn't sing for crap. But she could act. I mean, like the reviews of her performances are, for the most part, they're relatively positive. But in order to keep herself in the news and to stay relevant, she had to employ a few um, questionable tactics. Some of them are hilarious. Some of them I absolutely just love because they're so ridiculous. Like her pet pig Mimi with his diamond collar lost overboard from the Provence. As the day was warm, Celestine took off Mimi's seal skin jacket to let him run around the deck and show his diamond collar off in the bright sun. <laughs> Suddenly, there was a scream on the promenade deck from Celestine. This is in like French. I'm gonna do my best to read it correctly. So vous lis vite la pauvre, la pauvre Mimi. <laughs> Mademoiselle Polaire, who was reading Caesar's commentaries in the library, rushed out on the deck at the side of the ship, exclaiming, Mon petit cochon! Mon mimi! And when she couldn't see no signs of her pet in the seething blue water, she burst into tears and would not be comforted. <laughs> to read this, like, I'm reading this as it is written. <laughs> it is not that I care for the colère that I buy in Paris for 300... For th Bad. <laughs> I'm gonna try it again. It, it, it is not that I care for the color that I buy in Paris. <laughs> no, that's not how they say Paris. So I'll have you try this again. It is not that I care for the color that I buy in Paris for 22,000 francs, but les petits cochons, Mimi. Hello, je en si place of my, of my Mimi put. She's, she's sweet as a lady. <laughs> she says. <laughs> okay. There, there is not one I can, I can to the reporters at the pier. Her two pet dogs, Fifine and Hortense, were also désolé, she affirmed, at the loss of their playmate. <laughs> I'm not apologizing to that for that, France, because that is literally how it's written in the in the newspaper article. I am just doing an accurate in in character reading of how emotional it was. 
from this 1913 newspaper article. Okay, cool. Glad we have that talk. Don't come for me. I thought it made sense dramaturgically. <laughs> oh, my Mimi! <laughs> All that being said, while I do find some of her, like, I do find some of the stuff that she does hilarious, it's also not without being extremely problematic. And I would be remiss to not actually point this out in this video because I don't want to paint this romantic picture of Polaire and just ignore this point about her because while I could tell this whole video and not talk about it, I, it would not be right of me to do that. One of the worst things that Polaire ever did, and it was shocking at the time too, like it, it, this was the point, was on her first trip to New York in 1910. When she was leaving New York, she claimed to have purchased a black slave. Now, we know that by 1910, slavery had been abolished in the United States, but this is still what she said. And this is also how the media spun it. The man was an adult, he was 19 years old. And from what you can actually tell, it seems more that she just hired him as like a manservant. And then she was like, ha ha ha, I'm gonna call him my slave because oh my gosh, that's gonna get me so, atten so much attention, which is disgusting. It's, it's gross. The part that she did to really amplify this was she made him wear a collar that said, I belong to Polaire, if found, please return. It's gross, it's gross. And the way that the media spoke about this man was terrible. The fact that Polaire put him in this situation was terrible. And then literally like a couple months after she had taken him back to France as her manservant, then there was a rumor going around that she wanted to get rid of him. But I guess within the contract that like she couldn't fire him. This is why this is all like messed up. If he was on foreign soil. So like, I don't, and then it's like eventually he just disappeared. Like you don't hear anything from him ever again. And so we can't just talk about how funny she was without also talking about how awful she was and how she monetized the shock and awe of enslaving people for personal gain because it's disgusting. All of these antics were done to draw attention away from her competition. And what I find interesting about these decisions is how she utilized the same marketing tactics as Victorian freak shows and circuses. <laughs> Now, before we get into this, I do want to provide context around the word freak because the way we use freak today is different than how the Victorians and the Edwardians would use freak. So Nadja Durbach, who is the leading expert on freak shows and circuses of the Victorian and Edwardian era, she argues that Victorians used freak almost as a symbol of awe. It is also closely associated with celebrity and it does not necessarily have a negative connotation like it does today. So Nadja also argues that while today we might view freak shows as exploitive, harmful, and degrading, in the Victorian era that doesn't actually seem to be the case. These people would join freak shows with their full understanding and consent, they actually made good money doing what they did, that they made more money than the managers did, and that they were able to earn a healthy income with a certain level of fame and notoriety. For example, Joseph Merrick, before he became the Elephant Man, he was actually in a workhouse for five years because he had nowhere else to go. And even before the workhouse, he was going from home to home, from job to job, trying not to be a burden on his family. And so for him to join the show meant that he was able to earn a living independently without being a burden to anyone. So how did the freak show influence Polaire? Mainly it was her marketing tactics. Like this woman literally ripped like freak show tactics and just like apply them to herself. Now, what's really hard to nail down the factual truth about Polaire's history and her origins as a performer, there is conflicting evidence like we've already talked about. I did find one reference, Tatler, that says she actually got her start as a circus writer. There was at least a understanding or an idea or a rumor in the early 1900s that Polaire got her start in the circus and maybe she like worked to quash that rumor um, and that also does kind of cooperate with the letter to the editor that I read from the 1940s about Polaire and saying like her parents were like stage performers. I don't know why, I guess in my mind that also equaled like circus, which could be where she learned these kind of freak show marketing tactics. Or it could just be she saw how they advertise themselves and went, oh, hey, I can just do that for myself. I don't know, we don't know. From about 1905 to about 1913, uh, Polaire uses three 
main marketing tactics to keep media attention on her that to me are directly lifted from freak show marketing ploys. They are the ugliest woman in the world, the smallest waist in the world, and oh my God, she has a nose ring. Now what's different between those three media headlines versus say, oh my God, my pig committed suicide is that ugliest woman in the world, smallest waist in the world, and nose ring all have to do with Polaire's appearance not her behaviors, her body. And what do freak shows focus on? The body. And that's where they directly tie into the concept of the freak show. And that's why I wanna call those three out specifically versus some of her other ones. Now, as for the ugliest woman in the world, that one's a direct lift, man. Like there's, the, it's, it's a direct lift, okay? Like she didn't make that up. That has been a tagline used in freak shows for decades, quote. The dead body on display at 191 Piccadilly, a gallery usually reserved for high art, was Julia Pastrana, who five years earlier had exhibited herself in London as a hairy woman. Alive, she was sometimes billed as the nondescript, the gorilla woman, or the ugliest woman in the world. When she died in 1860, her body was preserved and re-exhibited to an even more fascinated public. When we see photos of Blake Polaire today, we don't really see someone who I think most of us would consider ugly, let alone like deserve the title of ugliest woman in the world. With how the media was in the early 1900s, you know, this was a way to really draw attention. Before she would show up to a place, what would she have the media print about her? That she was the ugliest woman in the world. And they're like, well, I wanna see this ugly woman go and perform this on stage. And what does it do? It puts butts in seats because people wanna see if she is actually the ugliest woman in the world. Plus, her ugliness forces people to talk about her and her appearance. It encourages that discussion while completely ignoring not only her competition, but her fellow cast members. It's genius, especially if you have a thick skin and you don't care what people say about you. The way Polair dressed and the way she looked was also unusual for the time. She wore heavy makeup unapologetically. She not only would rouge her cheeks and wear lipstick, but she also was rumored to rouge her gums and her tongue to make them extra red. She wore the blue eye cosmetic. She wore mascara before it was really, really common. She cut her hair really short as a bob before the 1920s and frizzed it all out. So it was like she electrocuted herself. Like she created this persona of the ugly eccentric woman to get attention onto her. But the funny thing is, is she then also spun it around on its head. So when she showed up in New York for the first, well, not for the first time, but the first time as a famous person in 1910, all the headlines were ugliest woman in the world, ugliest woman in the world arrives, da, 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 da. and then like there's this headline. I'm not ugly, cries Polaire. I'm not ugly, cried the latest Hammerstein importation in French as she glided down the gangplank into the arms of 30 reporters while a fair and frolicsome press agent, Miss Nell Ravel, caught the Medusa by the automobile veil, produced a tape measure, and demanded permission to measure the famous waist of the ugliest woman in the world. 42 centimeters, cried the Medusa, while all the reporters fell back aghast. <gasps> Shocked. 14 inches, Miss Revel announced. Who said I was ugly? Asked Polaire, snapping her big red mouth and blinking her southern looking eyes. Everybody backed away. Here's a counter to that from the New York Times just two days later, June 7th, 1910. Polaire ugly? Not by any means. Moreover, this French woman has a magnetism and she can act. What the audience at the Victoria saw yesterday was an attractive, well-formed woman whose waist may or may not be smaller than any other. But I mean, that's just it. It's like, she wasn't actually ugly, but they used that and her hair and everything in the cosmetics to help amplify that. But that marketing tactic only lasts so long once you've traveled the world and everyone has seen you for themselves and like, oh, she's not actually that ugly. She's just kind of, I mean, like she's kind of, different looking, but she's not, uh, she's fine. I'm uncomfortable, she's fine. She's fine, she's fine. So what do you do then when you ride this I'm so ugly train to profit, but then everyone in the world now knows that you're not actually ugly? Well, you gotta change your marketing tactics, right? August 20th, 1913, Polaire makes a grand announcement, both in the magazine, the sketch, and the magazine Tatler, and that is, she got a nose ring. <laughs> 
Now, the best thing about this announcement is that both of these images are obviously from the same photo shoot. They were published on the same day in different magazines, and they don't give a flying fuck that her nose ring is in two different spots. She she changed her nose ring around. It's fake. It's not even real. Whether or not she did eventually get her septum pierced, it's hard to say. That magazine clipping that I was talking about from that scrapbook describes Polaire as having a septum piercing and also having her nipples pierced. So it could be that like she did the fake thing and it went so well and people were so excited about it that she went ahead and just committed to having it done for realsies. And she was asked why she got her nose pierced. And this is what she said. And again, think about Freak Show and the body and marketing, okay? That she adopted the Zulu style in jewelry in order to avoid being a gun build in New York to which the city she will soon return as the ugliest woman on earth. Now she says American managers are simply bound to feature her as the only living actress who wears a ring in her nose. Wow. <laughs> what a move, right? Like, what a move. Now, here's the thing. The other thing that Polaire was oftentimes billed as was that she was Algerian. She is also oftentimes photographed in Middle Eastern or South Asian inspired fashions. Polaire wasn't ethnically Algerian. She was ethnically French. And yet she was still able to market herself as Algerian throughout the early 20th century. So managers of freak shows also leaned heavily into marketing the ethnicities of different people and different cast members within their freak shows, not only to appeal to Europe and North Americans like curiosity, but to also feed into those regions uh, imperialistic tendencies and delusions of grandeur. Nadia Durbeck wrote, as the last specimens of a now extinct nation, the Aztecs functioned as a warning of the decline and fall of even complex civilizations. At the height of Britain's industrial and imperial ascendancy, however, this performance also encouraged spectators to construct themselves as members of a historically unparalleled and uniquely advanced culture that would not only survive, but expand, progress, and inevitably dominate the globe. So the adaptation of the nose ring by Polaire, whether intended to or not, was another example of her utilizing her otherness of being born in Algeria for personal profit and gain. The public can now see this exotic actress with a nose ring go and perform without ever having to actually watch a woman of color perform. And when I was talking to my friend Nami about this and I was having her read this over, she, she left me with a really great quote and I, I wanna read it to you directly. She wrote, the historical appropriation and profit of marginalized and colonized cultures by and for white colonizers is why cultural appropriation is still a problem today. It was historically normalized in the not distant past and it is only now that people from those cultures have the power and platform to condemn how colonizers profited from their cultural practices while simultaneously villainizing and othering the people from these cultures, as shown in Polaire marketing herself using a quote unquote barbaric fashion. The thing that Polaire was the most famous for that was literally referenced in tandem to her name anytime she was mentioned in the media was the fact that she had the smallest waist in the world. Wow. So reports of her waist vary anywhere between 13 to 17 inches, where 14 inches is kind of the most common size that she's reported to have had. And there is article after article talking about Polaire's waist. There are whole spreads devoted to Polaire's waist and whether or not she does actually have the smallest waist in the world or if she's been unseated with the smallest waist in the world. It was such a point of newsworthy media attention that both the London Opera House and Hammerstein's Victoria Theater in New York, they gave away little paper waist tapes at her performances that said, this is Pola Polaire's waist measure. What's yours to people in the audience so they could compare their waist size to hers? Like that's how like much of a big deal her waist size was, okay? What we need to understand is that if they're marketing her waist this aggressively being that small, that is how weird it was. That is how unusual it was. Like if the average American woman or the average British woman or the average French woman was walking around with this size waist all the time, it wouldn't be newsworthy. It wouldn't be marketable. They wouldn't be making merch about it. No one would care. So what that tells us is that in the Edwardian era, this was a big 
deal. This was shocking. This was unusual. With that being said, did she actually achieve a 14 inch waist? Evidence says probably. In the magazine clipping, the person who's talking about Polaire goes actually into great detail about how Polaire achieved that waist size. Her frocks for the Victoria Palace show were all made to fit tightly over a 14 inch waist, which was part of her contract with a clever management. Normally she was laced to an over corset size of 16 inches day and night and was comparatively comfortable from my observation of her. But the reduction of a further two inches for several hours twice daily was a supreme effort. And I should say that she was almost down and out most of the time that she was on stage. While she probably did at least lace down to 14 inches for stage performances, she obviously wasn't wearing a 14 inch corset for her day to day. We also see this in that newspaper article where she screams out her waist is 42 centimeters. That's not 14 inches, that's 16 and a half inches. While the woman measured 14 inches, we're literally seeing conflicting numbers here. So even if she was at a 14 inch waist when she got off the boat because the media was there, she might've just had a bit of a slip saying like she's a 16 inch, 16 and a half inch, 17 inch waist because that's actually her normal normal waist size. Every photo that I've seen of Polaire and even Polaire's competition for smallest waist, they're all edited. None of them are genuine. What that means is like, even if she did have a 14 inch waist or a 17 inch waist, they were still editing her to look smaller and more freakish than what she even was, which is just kind of mind blowing to me. Like, why would you edit someone like when they already have just extremely tiny waist? Like it doesn't make any sense to me, but that's what they did. If all of these photos of Polera are edited, how do we even know then what she actually looked like? Amazingly, we do actually have video footage of Polera. We can definitely see that she did have like a really small waist for sure. But if she was tight laced down to 14 inches, she still was able to do that. So I'm just gonna let that sit there. And you know what I'm saying without saying it because you're all saying it too. Okay, good. Glad we have that talk. When I discovered Polaire, when I started reading about Polaire and I finally saw the images of her, I instantly recognized her, but I did not recognize her as Polaire. I recognized her as the woman who was always mentioned in videos about corsetry, whether it was the Victorian era or the Edwardian era, but whenever someone says wasp waist, there's usually a photo of Polaire somewhere. And that's what made me realize that no one knows who she is anymore. And that's why I wanted to do this video is because I wanted to tell you all about her because not only is she interesting, not only is she peculiar and fascinating and funny and, and odd and impressive and problematic, but she is also the woman that is mistakenly shared as a representation of normal dressing practices from the Victorian and Edwardian era, when that is categorically untrue. She was famous in the era for having a tiny waist. Like she is the unusual, she is the freak. She is not the norm. Like the way I can kind of equate this for you all, it's like if someone 150 years from now takes a photo of Jennifer Lopez from today and goes, this is what all 50 year old women looked like in 2020. That ain't true. Jennifer Lopez is the freak. She's the weird one. She looks amazing. She is not the representation of the average. She is the exception to the rule. And Polaire is the same. Obviously, while she was world famous in her era for being an actress, she eventually time forgets and she has been forgotten, but her images still remain. Eventually, Polaire did kind of fade into obscurity, not like wretched obscurity, but just, you know, her, her star just kind of faded. Like she was getting older. She was in her forties when World War One happened. And so she was a little too old for the moving pictures and the talkies and silent films. And so eventually she just kind of retired. She died at the age of around 69 or so in the 1930s. She did write a, a memoir about her life in the 1930s before she passed away, but I don't think it's still in print and I have never been able to find a copy of it in English that's been translated, unfortunately. And so with that, that is the story of Polaire. I do hope you enjoyed this video. Go ahead and give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, if you haven't done so already and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so. And with that, I'll see you all back here next time with another video. Bye. Caesar's commentary, my ass. That bitch was reading smut and we know it. <laughs> she was like, ah, I'm Claudine! With her slippers on, and I will not be ashamed. He's so good. He's so good. <laughs> oh, good job. Good acting. Oh, well, thank you. That's what I wanted. How can you go? No money shots from me. People, you want them tootsies, you're gonna pay for them. Gwiffy, 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 gwiffy.